Bienvenidas a todos, bienvenidos. And welcome, welcome everyone. We are going to start now. It's 5 and 31 minutes. There will be people getting into the room, but I would like to welcome those who are already here. And I am Lydia. I am really happy to be able to welcome you all today. And thank you, thank you so much for your interest in this session, this session of the y esperemos que bueno os guste a todos y podáis participar eh, al final de, de la sesión que ahora os explicaremos un poco cómo va a funcionar así que bueno pues bienvenidas como os decía a todas las personas que estáis ahora I would like to welcome all of you who are connected or connecting to the session this is an online round table as you can see and we hope next year we'll be able to do it here presentially so this session which is of much interest apparently we have called it the hidden cost of cheap food so we wanted to thank the um, green europeans foundation which organizes this online debate with the support of the uh, transition verde foundation and we thank them for their invitation and I thank them for inviting me uh, to moderate this debate. We also thank La Casa Encendida and the Spanish Association for Ecological Agriculture for collaborating in the organization of this series and this specific event. So as I was saying, let us remind you the conditions to participate. You can ask your questions by using the chat box uh, where you're all saying good afternoon. So on that same chat you can ask questions we will be noting down all the questions and we will be asking the questions as they come along so please try and ask the questions at the end of the session we will be oh, we will warn you of the fact that you can start writing your questions so that we can consider them all from the beginning to the end so if you can't if we get different questions that are uh, that deal with the same topic, we will just regroup them so that we have time to deal with them all. And we wanted to remind you all that we have interpretation, simultaneous interpretation. Our colleague Matilde is going to translate and we want to thank her for her job. And during this session, there are only two Spanish speaking people and the rest will be speaking English. So what do we want to talk about during this session? Well, we have been answering during previous sessions, and I'm, I guess that some of you have already participated in some of the previous sessions. So in this cycle, we talk about how the food is produced, how it reaches our table. I'm going to ask you to please, I'm sorry, but Lydia has muted herself, I believe. I'm sorry, Lydia, your microphone is, is off. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, I was, I, I closed my microphone um, by accident. So what do we want to talk about during this session? As I said, we have been during these sessions, uh, the two previous sessions of this cycle, because we began on September 21st, we started talking about how the food is produced, how it reaches our table, what happens during the whole production, distribution and consumption chain, what is the social impact and environmental impact that our current industrial model has. We know that producing cheap food has deep environmental, social, and health impact, what we called the hidden cost of cheap food. And we are going to try during this session, we're going to try to focus on a soy monoculture and industrial aquaculture and animal welfare. We also have uh, Thomas Waits, and we will um, introduce all of the speakers, um, but Thomas Waits will talk from the European um, Parliament. He will talk about what it is that we're doing in Europe to try and fight against this industrial agriculture. So we're going to talk about all of these things. Let me introduce the speakers to you. We will have time to listen to them all and to ask questions to them. First of all, let me introduce Nazaret Castro. Hi, Nazaret. Good afternoon. She is a journalist. She has a PhD in social sciences. She is the co-founder of Carro de Combate, um, dedicated to independent journalism. And they research the origin of the food that we uh, consume. And she 
wrote the world, the monocultures that conquered the world and uh, consuming as a political act and bittersweetness, which is a story about the origins of sugar. Then we will give the floor to Natasha Hurley. Hi, Natasha. She is the campaign director uh, for Changing Markets, where she is the director of a campaign to uh, stop or phase out hydrofluorocarbons. And then we also have Olga Kiku, she is the director of Compassion in World Farming. She is also a member of the uh, Green European Foundation, and she coordinates the cage-free uh, working group that is made up of um, European members of parliament. Then we also have Thomas Waits. He is the co-president of the European Green Party. And he is a European MP for the uh, Greens EFA. His work focuses on sustainable agriculture, regional production, and healthy food. And he also deals with common agricultural policy, which we will be talking about as well, and the reform of the Animal Transport Directive. So we will start now with Nazaret Castro. Good afternoon, Nazaret. We wanted to ask you, first of all, we were talking about the environmental impact and social impact, which you have researched in depth, and health impact of this boom of a soy monoculture in uh, the global south mainly. What do you think is the responsibility of the European Union in this situation with regards to this industry, this meat industry as well, and the expansion of macro farming, which is something that we are dealing with in Spain right now? So, Nazaret, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. I would like to start by thanking all of the organizers and the people following along for being here. It is an honor to be a part of this panel. And I also have to say that I'm happy to be part of this session because we at Carro de Combate, what we do, as Lydia said, um, what we do for and have been doing for 10 years is analyze the social social and environmental impacts of what we consume and what we are researching are the hidden costs actually what the economists sometimes uh, refer to as externalities that are not included in the um, cost paid by a company and it's usually other bodies and other territories who pay for that and in the case of soy it is one of the cases that we have studied in depth for the book monocultures that conquered the world and it's also one of the things that i am very interested in because i lived in argentina for 10 years and as many of you i'm sure know they are the main producers and exporters of soy the world over and uh, soy in an important way is actually a very interesting case to really understand how the agri-food uh, sector works worldwide what some people have called the uh, corporate the corporate regime, uh, corporate agri-food regime. And it's important to talk about regime because it uh, refers to something systemic, a structural dimension. The problem are not some specific cases such as soy or Brazil or a certain industry, but rather the problem is systemic. It's a model which, as Bill Mollison said, he is the father of permaculture, is not, is not designed to produce food, but rather to produce money. And soy, as I was saying, and this ag corporate agri-food regime is something that we need to highlight because it's actually multinationals that worldwide control this, this chain. So in order to summarize what are the hidden costs of soy in particular, there is something that is quite basic that we need to understand, which is the role of toxic substances, especially glyphosate, but there are others that are not very well known that are also very much toxic. As I said, soy is really um, an example of agri-food business, which is just a technological package. A multinational such as Monsanto that now belongs to, uh, to Bayer in the 90s um, invented a, a soy transgenic seed that is being sold with pesticides. <coughs> this soy, it's called intact RR because it resists 
thanks to glyphosate to to these to this pesticide so the big hidden cost has to do with the impacts that this has in bodies and territories because this soy this transgenic soy has been uh, changed its dna has been changed so that it can resist to the effect of this pesticide so that everything dies around it all the weed that undesired weed dies but the soy remains so for so to be profitable we need to use poison and this obviously has an impact in the health there is a whole polemic around whether it affects the people who eat it or not but quite clearly it does have an impact in, in the populations that live around the, um, these these cultures and that was identified in argentina thanks to um, a group of militants who are the the people in Córdoba, uh, the mothers of Ituatzingo, they started realizing that um, there was an, an unproportionate increase of certain diseases, certain types of cancer, such as fetal formation, uh, dermatological diseases. They thought it was the water that was in a bad but state and the state decided to ignore them, but they started contacting independent organizations and amongst them all they started understanding that this was a product of being very close to soy monocultures and pesticides with glyphosate were being uh, fumigated from the air. And obviously that, uh, that got to them, it got to rural schools that are in these areas of the country. So the first hidden cost has to do with that and and that is obviously something that happens in other territories. In Argentina, for instance, over 60% um, of the um, area of the country is, is, is cultivated with soy. And that's like in Uruguay and Brazil, in the Mato Grosso, in, in, in that area. So glyphosate and pesticides, herbicides to... Uh, allow for this transgenic soy to be to be cultivated has contaminated and polluted both the water and the soil in the case of argentina this has been really studied by universities and we know that glyphosate now is raining down on argentina they have gotten samples from rainwater and there is glyphosate in that rain there is glyphosate as well in the uh, the deepest part of the parana river it has been introduced in their hydrological cycle and obviously there are other problems that have to do with deforestation and the deforestation of ecosystems as important as the Cerrado in Brazil or in the north of Argentina and Paraguay. And this obviously has allowed for a great loss of biodiversity, obviously, and it also contributes to climate change and the acceleration of, glo of global warming. And it also has a direct impact in zoonotic diseases, something that scientists had been saying for a very long time and nobody listened to them. But now after pandemic and the COVID-19, we should understand how this affects us, how we human beings are affected by the fact that animals are, are getting kicked out of their habitat. And soy, as any other monoculture, requires a very intensive process. So that re means that many nutrients have to be extracted from the soil. So after a few uh, years, the land is deserted and it loses all of its nutrients. So for the produ producing countries, it's it's actually something that's good now, uh, economic-wise, but it's it's poverty in the future. So why should we wonder about this in Europe? Because we are encouraging that model because Europe is one of the main um, important countries of the soy that is being produced in the in the global south. Why? Well, because we import soy to produce. Um, animal feed, especially for pigs. That is why there is a link with the proliferation of mega farms, macro farms in Spain, especially in uh, pig farms. We are leaders in pig, pig meat production in Spain, and we also import it to create agro uh, fuels. And we have to say that this is uh, worrisome because uh, with my colleagues from Carro de Combate, we drew a report that I'm going to link on the chat because a few years ago, we uh, really showed the impact of palm oil in the environment. So Europe decided to replace palm oil with soy 
for agrodiesel production as if we could consider that soy sustainable when it's not. And after what we have been saying, we know it's not the case. And I will finish with this last idea, the idea of the fact that the problem is not a plant. It's not that soy is better than palm or uh, sugar cane. It's the model. It's the culture model, the intensive culture model. The problem is when a country, and in, now it's all the countries the world over, are disconnected from their way of producing food they are disconnected from the real needs to feed the population and they're just connected to demand the demand of international uh, markets that are too much under financial control and that is why there is um, a last hidden cost that i would like to highlight here to finish which is the fact that the main well we have seen it all all human beings animals and um, human or non-human, we are the big losers in this game. But the main losers are indigenous peoples who are affected by this displacement when the um, expansion of the agribusiness frontier uh, takes place. We see that in the with the Guarani uh, um, people in Paraguay, in Brazil, and it usually comes hand in hand with violence. And that is what I wanted to say. And I thank you for for giving me the floor so that now my colleagues can also speak. Thank you, Nazareth. Yes, we absolutely recommend your book, The Monocultures That Conquered the World, that you talked about, and about all of the social impacts that you have mentioned, which are the ones that really make us think about how we can get out of this system. Really, that's what we're looking for, a way out of the system. That is obviously difficult, but everything that you talk about in this book is quite revealing. We will now give the floor to Natasha quite quickly. Thank you, Natha. Uh, we will get back to you during the second round. So Natasha is now going to talk about industrial uh, agriculture. She is going to mainly talk about the European Union. So Natasha, we would like, if possible, for you to tell us what the data says with regards to, to to this system aquaculture industrial aquaculture and what are these impacts the main impacts as nazareth was saying with regards to soy the environmental impacts but also social impact and the repercussions with regards to food sovereignty in the south of europe and the global south well in the end it's always the south that is impacted by these these tendencies and what is the responsibility that the eu has with regards to all of this, how wide is the power of supermarkets and what's the relationship with these practices that have been proven to be unsustainable? Thank you very much, Natasha. Please go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to give my presentation in um, English, um, but I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, and as Lydia said, I'm going to present to you uh, on the topic of industrial aquaculture. And I wanted to share with you my screen. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Um, and hopefully you can all see that now. Um, I want to talk to you about um, a campaign that I've been leading since 2018 called Fishing the Feed. Um, and I work at the Changing Markets Foundation as campaign manager, and this is currently a really important focus for us. Just to give you some uh, background about what Changing Markets does, we're a global campaigning organization um, which was set up to investigate and expose irresponsible corporate practices. And the objective with everything that we do and all the issues we work on is to drive and accelerate um, the transition towards a more sustainable economy worldwide. Um, we work very collaboratively um, with other NGOs and with a whole range of um, partners around the world. Um, and I, I want to give you a flavor of, of the kind of work we do today, um, focusing on our Fishing the Feed campaign. And here you can see one of the photos that we took from one of our on the ground investigations in India in 2019, when we went to investigate the impacts of fish meal and fish oil production for use in the global aquaculture sector in India. And as you can see, it's a very shocking image of um, a huge amount of fish that has been caught in the wild, so in the ocean, and that has then been used to make into fish meal and fish oil. 
Um, so in this presentation, I want to give you some facts and figures about global aquaculture and explain why um, the focus of our campaign, which is the feeding of wild caught fish to farmed fish, why that practice is problematic. And I, I want to zero in on our work on West Africa. We um, recently published a big report with Greenpeace looking at the impacts of um, uh, fish meal and fish oil production in West Africa. And finally, look at the role and, and the power of supermarkets um, in this field and what they can do about the problem and, and to explain why we need to start calculating the true cost of, of aquaculture and its externalities. So first of all, some facts and figures on the global aquaculture industry. So globally, aquaculture has gone from supplying about 5% of the fish that we eat uh, about five decades ago to now supplying over half of all the fish that we consume globally. And by 2030, um, it's estimated that farmed fish and seafood, so um, products such as prawns, um, over 60% of all the seafood we consume will come from farming. Um, and if you look in Europe, um, at some of the big uh, aquaculture producing countries, which are Norway and Scotland. Norway has a huge salmon farming industry and it plans to increase production five times um, by 2050. And in Scotland, um, the Scottish salmon industry wants to double produ production by 2030. So we're already at a very high level when it comes to um, the uh, supply coming from the aquaculture industry. And that, supply is going to grow and grow um, over the coming decades if you look at the growth projections of, of um, farming companies. Now, one of the problematic things about that growth is that we are choosing to farm species that require feed inputs. So these are species that in the wild would be carnivorous, um, which means that they would eat other fish, such as salmon um, and prawns. And if you look at the graphs that here I'm showing to you, um, you can see, sorry, actually that's up for another slide, but here you can see the growth of the, the aquaculture industry. Um, and Europe has a very powerful aquaculture industry. It also has a very powerful feed industry. And here on this slide, you can see some of the key players in the aquafeed market, which are European players. So we have Norwegian companies, uh, Moe, um, Scretting, and Ewos Cargill. So it's obviously a subsidiary of the American company um, Cargill, but Ewos is a, originally a Norwegian company. And then we have Biomar, which is a Danish company. And those um, big corporate players produce aquafeed. So that's feed used in the aquaculture sector. So the big focus for us with our Fishing the Feed campaign is the practice of feeding wild caught fish to farmed fish. And um, just to explain in a few numbers why that is a very problematic practice, every year about um, a fifth, so 20% roughly, of global marine fish catches, so that's fish that are caught from the oceans, are, are used to make fish meal and fish oil. And most of this fish meal and fish oil is used to feed aquaculture. Some of it um, is still used in pig farming and chicken farming, but the majority of it is currently used in aquaculture. Um, and this is something that surprises a lot of people um, because it's, it sounds almost counterintuitive to people to know that fish are being taken from the oceans and ground down into fish meal and fish oil that's then going into aquafeed and supplying fish farms. Um, now on the graphs on the right here, you will see um, that at a European level, but also at the global level, the, the, um, the fed aquaculture industry, so that means aquaculture that requires feeding is increasing um, faster than non-fed aquaculture. So non-fed aquaculture would be, for example, mussel production. And I know that in Spain, there's um, quite a big mussel pr uh, producing industry. Um, mussel production is less problematic from a feed perspective than, for example, salmon um, and sea bass farming, because those species require 
feed inputs. And if you look at the global level, that fed aquaculture is increasing um, more rapidly than non-fed aquaculture. And that is obviously driving demand for the wild caught fish, which is made, um, which is used as a feed ingredient. And that wild caught fish is coming from countries that suffer from food insecurity in the global south. So some of the big fish meal and fish oil producing countries are um, in Southeast Asia, um, South Asia, so India is a big producer, Vietnam is a big producer, uh, and West Africa. Uh, all of these countries have, um, you know, vary to, to varying degrees, all of these countries have problems with food insecurity. Um, people in those countries are struggling to get enough food to eat. Um, and Peru in Latin America is a huge supplier to the global market. And similarly, Peru has significant food security problems um, if you look at the country as a whole. So um, that explains why this is a problematic process. Um, and I want to show you a quick film that we've made uh, for our campaign. So I'm just going to play this now and hope that you can hear it. <laughs> So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and I hope it gave a good explanation of, of what why our campaign is, is focusing on this very important issue. Um, very quickly, because I'm aware that I'm probably running out of time, I just wanted to um, talk briefly about our work in West Africa. Um, and this is a part of our sort of investigative and campaigning work um, around the world as part of our Fishing the Feed campaign. We uh, published a report with Greenpeace in July this year called Feeding a Monster, how European aquaculture and animal feed industries are stealing food from West African communities. And very briefly, that looked at how fish meal and fish oil production is expanding very rapidly in some West African countries. Now, this is because these countries have access to um, very precious fish stocks that are highly prized by the fish meal and fish oil production sector. Their, their stocks of fish such as sardinella, which are very oily and very nutritious fish. And these fish make very good um, fish meal and fish oil. And in particular, the fish oil is used in um, salmon farming. And we know, for example, that um, some of the big um, uh, salmon producers and or aquafeed producers are sourcing fish oil from West Africa. Um, the supply chain, it's very important to, to point out that the supply chain is a very opaque supply chain, so it's very difficult to understand in detail where the fish oil that is produced in West Africa is ending up. But we do know that, for example, um, Moi, one of the biggest, in fact, the biggest producer of farmed salmon in the world, um, and a big producer of aquafeed itself, um, we know that they source um, every year thousands of tons of fish oil from Mauritania. And you can see Mauritania on the map here. It's the, the big country in light yellow. And Mauritanian fish meal and fish oil production has increased very rapidly um, in recent years. Now, in our report with Greenpeace, we calculated that every year about half a million tons of wild caught fish. So that's 500,000 tons of wild caught fish go into fish meal and fish oil production in West Africa, and that, that that amount of fish could be used to feed people directly instead, and it could provide protein for about 33 million people um, in Africa. So um, this picture here is um, a photo that was taken um, from an investigation we carried out in the Gambia, 
and it shows a fish meal um, factory where the fish is landed and brought from the, the sea directly to the factory, piled up to go into um, fish meal and fish oil production. And here on the right, you can see um, a, a map showing the uh, sardinella stocks, the stocks of these little oily fish that I was talking about and how those stocks circulate up and down the coast of West Africa. So um, this, this being to illustrate that these stocks are shared stocks and they're shared among several countries. And that, you know, the fact that Mauritania, for example, has a rapidly expanding fish meal um, industry is problematic for other countries in the West Africa region that rely on these fish for protein and for artisanal livelihoods. Um, now, very briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, um, I wanted to touch on the power of supermarkets. Now, a lot of our work um, in, in the recent um, year or so has focused on the important role that supermarkets play in this market. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, um, salmon um, is, for example, becoming an increasingly popular fish on supermarket shelves across Europe. I know that that's true in, in Spain as well. Uh, and Spain is the EU's second largest consumer of fresh salmon, accounting for about a quarter of salmon consumption in the EU in 2017. Most of that salmon is farmed. So clearly there is a strong link between the practices I have been describing, the industry I've been describing and the Spanish consumer market. And um, now the retailers across Europe have huge power, have huge economic power, and they had turnover of 3.5 trillion euros in 2018. And what we're saying to, um, to supermarkets is that they need to use this in, enormous market power that they have to try and drive change within the industry, to say to feed producers and fish farming companies that we need to eliminate the use of wild caught fish in aquaculture supply chains, because it's a highly unsustainable practice and something that has very negative impacts on populations in the global south, as, as I've shown. Um, this is a very quick um, illustration of some of the links that we found, thanks to our investigations between fish meal and fish oil production in countries like Vietnam, India, the Gambia, um, through the supply chain, and then ending up at the European retailers, including in Spain, for example, Mercadona, we were able to establish links to these highly damaging practices, uh, from these highly damaging practices right down to the, the supermarkets at the other end of the supply chain. And you can find more detail on, on this in our reports. Um, last year, we um, conducted a review of how Spanish retailers are performing and what policies and practices they have put in place to address this very big problem um, in their supply chain. And um, we found that Spanish retailers across the board performed very poorly on this issue. And you can find all the details on that in our Atrapados report if you want to find out more. Now, um, just to conclude, I want to um, say that we think that we need to start calculating the true cost of aquaculture, um, which currently is not being um, factored in when we think about um, fish consumption in Europe. So we, we commissioned some economic analysis earlier this year that found that across the world, the hidden cost of salmon farming, which takes into account um, factors such as the use of wild caught fish in feed, takes into account factors such as poor fish mortality, uh, poor fish welfare, sorry, and uh, mortalities on farms, which are very high, and found that the hidden cost of salmon farming is $50 billion globally um, since 2013. So we're talking about a huge cost to society and the environment from um, a sector that is growing very rapidly. Um, and what's true for salmon is true for other species as well. So I, I don't want this just to be about salmon. It's also about other farm species such as sea bass um, and prawns, for example. Um, and I think I'll, I'll come to, I'll draw to a close there, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that any of you might have um, after the presentation and um, to share any documents with you, um, any of our recent reports, um, which some of which are available in Spanish. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Natasha.
Muy interesante. Tasha, that was very interesting. And thank you for sharing the data. You can ask questions and I would like to thank the colleagues who are giving answers with uh, more information with the reports that Natasha was mentioning. And if you have any questions, you can start asking them on the chat so that we can write them down because Natasha has given lots of information. It was all very interesting and I'm sure that you're all asking yourselves questions about this. So we will now give the floor to Olga Kiku. She will talk, we, were going, we are going to go from aquaculture to animal welfare and talk about what uh, producing cheap food means with regards to animal suffering. And Olga is going to give us an answer. Olga, we would also like to know what initiatives you're putting in place, what your organization that you represent is doing to improve animal welfare. And um, since we've asked it to all speakers, I would like to know what's the answer that European institutions are giving to this topic. So Olga, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have shared my screen. I, I hope that you can see it. Please let me know if, if this is working. Perfectamente. Yeah. All right, great. Um, Okay, just uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll start with um, a slide regarding our organization. Uh, Compassion World Farming was uh, founded back in the 1960s, and now we have uh, offices and representatives in many European countries uh, and uh, the US and China. And in Europe, of course, we also have my colleague Patricia Derada in Spain. Um, the Back in the 1960s, um, when our organization was founded, um, we also had uh, a number of people who spoke, who started speaking out for animals. Uh, one of them was Ruth Harrison, um, when she wrote the book in uh, her book, Animal Machines in 1964, where she noticed that if one person is, a, is unkind to an animal, then this is considered to be cruelty. But when you have a lot of people who are unkind to animals, especially in the name of commerce, then this cruelty is condoned and um, actually is even financed and, of course, will be uh, defended uh, by um, otherwise intelligent people. Um, very, very interesting and true observation. Um, so since the, um, actually after the Second World War, we had this uh, phenomenon of uh, factory farming, which sort of permeated in the sector and actually uh, expanded uh, beyond uh, the developing, uh, the beyond countries such as the US, um, where it originated, um, and is very much uh, well established in Europe and elsewhere in the world. What does this mean for uh, for farmed animals. Um, well, I will focus in, in on Europe uh, for this uh, for this occasion. Um, this means that um, over nine billion land animals are used for food in the EU every year, um, and also uh, a very significant number of wild fish, um, as well as uh, fish in fish farms, are slaughtered in the EU every year. Um, the global number uh, for fish is estimated to be from one to three trillion per year. Um, so uh, most of the animals who are slaughtered, um, especially in Europe, are, come from factory farms, come from industrial animal farms. And uh, you have main major problems uh, associated with these farms. Uh, these include uh, life, uh, the very low life expectancy, uh, severe confinement, um, many animals living, actually spending most of their lives or their entire lives in cages. Um, um, others are tethered. It, uh, factory farming also means uh, many mutilations such as castration and debeaking. It means um, also diseases, um, infections, uh, use of antibiotics, uh, heavy use of antibiotics. Um, uh, force feeding in the case of uh, ducks and geese for the production of foie gras. Um, uh, for the production of milk, we have the separation of the mother from uh, the young. Um, um, lots of, as my, as my colleague uh, before, the, before me, as Natasha uh, pointed out, uh, serious issues regarding fish farming also. 
um, and uh, we have a, um, selective breeding of animals uh, where, whereby the animals are selected in order to produce more, uh, so for fast growth and high yield production. And um, we also have many serious issues regarding uh, slaughter methods, uh, and I will go into these later. So um, factory farming, and I'm not going to go into these today um, since I'm focusing on animal welfare, but uh, there are serious environmental concerns with factory farming, um, catastrophic environmental impact um, with industrial animal agriculture. There are also health concerns with the overconsumption of um, animal products, as is the case in, uh, in Europe and uh, the US and other countries. Uh, where animal, um, uh, where uh, the consumption of animal products is rising. Um, but I will focus on the moral concerns uh, regarding the, the, uh, the exploitation of animals into, from, uh, in, in this system. So um, I mentioned some of the problems, but we also have, because of the internet, because of uh, uh, the role of media uh, because of um, uh, campaigns that uh, many NGOs uh, have uh, embar embarked on, and because the animal of the animal advocacy movement, we have an emerging perception that um, uh, that using animals um, for food for the production of food um, should not be acceptable, especially in regards to. Um, uh, really bad conditions and really cruel uh, treatment in uh, factory farms. Um, there were many, as we've seen uh, throughout history, there were many practices that were very commonplace in the past, like slavery, child labor, etc., cetera, um, which were quite common, but uh, certainly are not accepted today. Therefore, we can say that our past and past practices cannot define what we do in the future. Um, I will uh, provide uh, just uh, three examples today to, uh, so you can uh, get an idea uh, about uh, what factory farming is about um, and industrial animal agriculture. Um, here, uh, the, this is the case with um, cages. Uh, hundreds of millions of animals in the EU are caged every year, either for part of their lives or their entire lives. And you can see the hens and the sows and, and uh, other animals. Um, the, the numbers are great and the suffering is great. Um, and um, of course, uh, caging animals causes um, not only health problems, but um, not only physiological problems, but also psychological problems. Um, and of course, increases the stress, um, which uh, in a way is uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, the industry tries to deal with this with um, antibiotics um, so that animals are not so uh, prone to diseases, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, many problems around this. Um, another case um, I will mention is the, the case of animal transport. And uh, I'm sure that uh, MEP uh, Thomas uh, Weitz will uh, talk more about this. Um, the uh, animal transport, of course, uh, millions uh, and millions of animals are transported every year. Uh, many are actually uh, exported outside the EU when we know that uh, uh, while animals, um, there is some sort of basic uh, protection um, uh, laws in the EU uh, regarding uh, the treatment of animals. Uh, this is not the case when they're exported um, outside the EU. So, you know, this is another major issue. Um, unfit animals um, uh, are, are transported, heavily pregnant animals or um, unweaned animals. Um, we have uh, high stocking densities there, um, too little headroom. Um, uh, many times animals are transported under very uh, high uh, temperatures. Um, and, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, again, um, as is the case in, in many cases, um, the use of, of sanctions is very limited. Um, and uh, we see that even countries that um, actually break the rules again and again and again, um, infringement proceedings are, um, are hard to come by. So the, the, there is a hesitation to start um, 
these proceedings uh, from the part of the EU. Um, another example is that of uh, slaughter of animals. And we see here how uh, I, I will specifically focus on two examples. Um, one is the uh, use of the CO2 um, use uh, for the stunning of pigs. Um, that is before slaughter. Um, pigs are put in groups um, and are given uh, CO2, um, which actually causes um, um, high levels of distress in pigs and uh, results in a high degree of animal suffering. Um, unfortunately, there are many, many millions of pigs who are um, stunned um, and, and killed with high concentrations of um, the CO2 gas. Um, also, uh, regarding chickens, as you can see, close to 6 billion um, broilers um, are stunned before slaughtered in the so-called electrical water bath. And this is um, uh, inhumane, of course, it's, it's, it's cruel. A lot of times uh, the animals are not um, uh, even their, their head because they are in, they're inverted, as you can see, their head does not really, they lift their heads up, so they're not, um, uh, they're not, their heads do not even go through the water. And a lot of times they end up going through the cutting blade while fully conscious. Um, so our work, um, uh, we work on all these issues and uh, we work especially with the um, uh, current, um, the current commission has as priorities the, the so-called European Green Deal and um, also especially uh, the, the one that is about food and agriculture is the farm to fork strategy. So we work on, on some of these, um, including um, uh, transport, or the Common Agriculture Policy um, and uh, many other files. In, regard to, in regards to the Farm to Fork strategy and the European Green Deal, um, uh, we, uh, we try to lobby the Commission, the European Parliament and other EU institutions um, to uh, revise the, the existing harm harmful uh, policies uh, and to uh, also in regards to food to promote um, the a higher consumption of um, uh, plant-based products and, and, and to promote plant-rich diets. Um, we hope that um, as, as we move along in, during this term, the, during this commission term, that um, um, there will be a wider acceptance of, the, of some of the goals of the, the farm to fork policy. Also, in regards to the, uh, the common agricultural policy, um, uh, we have, uh, of course, this is a huge file. We are talking about the farm subsidies. Um, uh, just very recently, I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I referred here to the example of the so-called burger ban and um, uh, the, 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 the plant-based, the veggie burger plan. And um, uh, fortunately, this was, uh, the ban was averted. Um, but of course, uh, this is a policy whereby um, a lot of money, billions of euros are given uh, to support uh, farmers, but they actually end up supporting um, an existing um, system of industrial animal agriculture. Um, we also work on fish welfare. Um, our organization has a, a fish dedicated uh, team and uh, just uh, recently uh, we are uh, we were uh, quite glad to see that um, um, uh, there were um, EU guidelines uh, for sustainable um, aquaculture and fish welfare uh, was included for the first time. Um, also we are working closely with the parliament and um, uh, trying to engage uh, MEPs in this topic and uh, just recently the PESH committee, the, the um, fisheries committee in the European Parliament commissioned a report on fish welfare. Um, again, like uh, the transport of uh, animals, um, the, the European Commission has committed to revise the transport regulation. And also there is a, um, a, a transport specific uh, group of MEPs in the European Parliament. Um, uh, uh, Thomas is going to talk to you about it. Um, again, uh, looking to Olga, uh, como... implementation. 
Gracias. Como precisamente Thomas, I have, I Thomas is going to talk about this. Sobre okay. ello, si quieres, Since Thomas is going to talk about this, if you want, we can give him the floor and then we will continue during the second round about what you were going to present here now. Thank you okay. very much. All right. We will give uh, co del Partido Verde Europeo. president of the European Greens Party. He is an MP, um, European MP. Uh, Olga was actually talking about those European policies from farm to fork. We wanted to ask you, I know you have the worst part of this debate, but I'm sure that you will give us lots of information regarding this and you will be able to provide us with some answers regarding what the previous speakers have said. Is the EU responsible and is it is it showing accountability with regards to these impacts? We know that the current system does not, well, gives us cheap food, but because it does not include this hidden cost, this uh, negative consequences, external consequences, and it's um, organic agricultures who are the ones getting the worst part. We don't know if this CAP or this farm to fork policy or the just next generation funds will be a real opportunity to improve this, uh, this system. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, as uh, very often, the answers are not easily uh, done with yes or no. Um, let me start where, where Olga was just ending. We're having an inquiry committee on animal transport across the European Union and on all the cruelty that is happening there, and especially on the exports outside of the European Union. And if you look closer into the question, why are we actually transporting live animals in such numbers and on long distances? You're, we could actually come back to the very first intervention that we've seen today when it comes to soy, because basically the European agricultural model means we're planting or we're using landscapes uh, in the global south where the fodder for the animals is planted. We're importing the fodder, we're stuffing it into chicken and and uh, and pork, but also beef. And, and then we're exporting the produce or the animals or the meat uh, into half of the world. And to do all of this, we have created a very industrialized uh, 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 animal production system in huge factories. And we're talking here not so much anymore about farmers, but we're talking about commercial enterprises that are actually running these huge feeding and fattening farms. Uh, and, and, and then uh, we have also uh, lost a lot of regional slaughterhouses. So we had a huge concentration in the so-called slaughter business. And this is why we need to transport animals for so long distances. But this is just one of the symptoms of a whole system that it, it implies a lot of problems uh, to our society. Uh, let me come back to two concrete examples, which I wanted to share with you on the hidden cost costs of cheap food, very concrete ones. In my region, it's also a pork producing region, a lot of pork there. We're having uh, 90,000 inhabitants in my region and 1 million pork. So you can imagine how much manure is put on the landscape. Uh, and this manure uh, is uh, causing a nitrate, massive nitrate uh, um, influx into the soil water. So we think, or citizens think, they're buying cheap pork meat in the supermarket produced in these pork breeding plants. But in fact, if you see the water bills that they're paying every day, uh, they are actually paying the costs for the water company needing to clean the water, to mix the water, to build a pipeline from the Alps, uh, to mix the water so it, they can actually sell it to the citizens. And this creates one of the highest water bills in the whole region, exactly where the pork is produced. So you're actually paying the price for your cheap piece of more pork with your water bill. It's the very same citizens, but unfortunately it's all citizens paying the price and not just the ones that produce and consume the pork. Uh, another direct uh, example uh, is all the transport system, all the cruelty, but it's not only about the cruelty, but it's also, and we have also heard it, the extensive use of antibiotics in the, in the feeding industry. And just to mention that here, all available antibiotics can be used for animal production and are used for animal production because the bacteria are getting resistant against uh, all these antibiotics. And that leads to multi-resistant bacteria, which are literally immune against all antibiotics on the market. And this causes around 33,000 deaths 
humans. Only in the European Union every year, this is infections where no antibiotic is still working. And this is due to this animal factory farming systems. And I don't even want to call this a cost. It's a hidden death toll that we're paying for this kind of agricultural industry. Next is the impact on, 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 on pesticides that has that pesticides have on our health. I just talked to the Ramazzini Institute and they're preparing or they're ha having a lot of international studies also with Argentina and with the Global South on glyphosate and on the use of Roundup. We've heard it earlier in the, in the first intervention and they are, are building clear proof that it's not just the negative environmental impacts, but on the humans that are actually eating food that contains remainants of the glyphosate, that this has a massive impact on our biome. So on all of these organisms that live within our stomach and that allow us to actually ferment, process food and actually feed ourselves. And they're proving that the impact on the biome is so drastic that this is even not just having a physical impact on us, but also a mental impact because they are able to prove that the functioning digestion system is directly also linked with our with the functionality of our brains so it's literally making us stupid uh, and 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 so also this these impacts uh, of the past and i could go men uh, much deeper now on different pesticides on neonicotinoids on, on fungicides but this uh, we will not have time for that but the pesticides that we eat through the so-called cheap produced food uh, so the non-organic produced food are creating a direct health impact for ourselves for the whole society and this is a huge hidden cost of this kind of agricultural structure. And then with uh, the agriculture that we're doing, we're creating a huge loss of soil. So we're losing due to erosion, desertification, uh, uh, due to, due to uh, um, uh, uh, com compressing the soil. We're losing fertility. We're losing the, the grounds of our food production. And this is endangering our future food security massively. How stupid can one be to actually kill the basic substance you're growing food on, which is the soil? Oil. It's very dramatic in South America, but it's also very dramatic in Spain and other European countries. Uh, we're killing biodiversity. Uh, we have a massive re reduction and, and of, of, of species. We're losing species every year. And if a species is once extinct, there's no way to bring the species back again. And this is more and more endangering our ecosystems because our ecosystems are getting out of balance because some species are missing and they cannot fulfill their role in the complex system of our ecosystems, which is creating a huge pressure back on agriculture again, but back on all of us, on the human beings. <clears throat> then we have the massive negative impact on climate. Today, agriculture is one of the biggest, if not the biggest contributor to global CO2 emissions. In Europe, only 12% of the emissions, but if you include the fodder that we're importing, we're already around 18% of all CO2 or CO2 related emissions, climate related emissions to the atmosphere. And we all see every year in summer, in winter, the extreme weather, the droughts, the floodings, all of that, are direct uh, costs uh, that we're co-producing with the kind of food production that we have. And what is extra awkward in that point is that actually agriculture and forestry uh, would be part of the solution if we change to organic or close to nature farming, because only farming and forestry have the capacity to store CO2 back into the soil through plants that grow via photosynthesis, collecting CO2, and then we use the plants instead of artificial fertilizer inorganic agriculture to fertilize the soil so we dig it into the soil and like this we're sequesting co2 into the soil so we could make at agriculture turning it to close to nature and organic to part of the climate solution but what is actually happening uh, on the ground is we're fueling the climate disaster on top of that we're losing farmers because they can't keep up with the pressure of industry and unfair prices and we have a loss of health in our society so let me now just 
course come very shortly on the policies. Uh, the answer, whether it's going in a good or bad direction, is not so easy. We have with the commission uh, an ambitious commission that has realized that we need to take action in this field. On the other hand, we have a huge amount of counter pressure from and from these industries and this is fossil fuels based based industries very much and this this agribusiness is is making billions and billions and billions of euros we could talk about gmo seeds we could talk about the links to the pesticide companies which is one and the same company we could talk about uh, again animal feeding and so on but this would take too much time now but but uh, the 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 fact that we're we're endangering with trying to go organic, we're endangering a huge business model is a clear one. What, why does the industry not like organic farming? Well, me as an organic farmer, I don't buy fertilizers, so they don't make money. I don't buy their seeds. Again, they don't make money. I don't need medication for my animals because they are free range 365 days a year and they eat grass and they're healthy. I don't need medication. So again, they're losing money and so on and so forth. So from this pair of rubber boots that I'm buying and maybe the machinery I'm buying, all these companies are not making a revenue. And that's why we have such a massive a counter pressure towards going green and going organic in agriculture. The cap has some positive elements, but by far not enough as we would have needed them. There's a lot of, let's say, greenwashing, a lot of fig leaves that pretends to be green measurements. But if you take a closer look, yeah, there's a lot of question. Precision farming, as an example, there can be good techniques, but precision farming as such is not an echo scheme. I could go into depth there massively. One of the biggest losses that we had. We were able to convince the parliament majority for a limit of 100,000 euros of subsidies. And most of the farmers and most of the citizens would say, well, 100,000 euro. I mean, that's a whole lot of money. Yeah. But no, uh, the massive amount of cap fundings go to the very few, very big enterprises. Uh, but the problem in the negotiations were the member states, they were killing this maximum capping of 100,000 euros. Well, surprise, as an example, Mr. Babish, the prime minister of Czech Republic, is running the biggest agro company of the, of the country. And he his own very own company gets between 30 and 50 million euros of subsidies every year. Uh, and that's how we're fueling the disaster. We're supporting the ones that are actually uh, uh, running these disastrous uh, farming strategies. And we're creating an absolute unfair competition to all the small family-based and uh, close to nature working farms. Um, so this is a disaster. And yes, farm to fork strategy, but this is just a strategy. So this is not concrete lawmaking, but just a framework, a guideline towards where, where we want to go. And already that gets a lot of counter pressure. There's a lot of lobbying to water the tax town to be not as concrete because the actual proposal from the commission was a good one. Minus 50% pesticides, minus 50% artificial fertilizers, mi yeah, minus 50% antibiotics. This was ambitious. Let's see how much we see at the end. And the actual crucial question will be, we're now starting on to work on the legal framework. So not on the strategy, but on the lawmaking. Uh, and there it's getting really rough, I can tell you, uh, when it comes to concrete measurements, uh, because we're facing a huge lobby wall against us uh, and we we the only thing that actually helps us is that more and more citizens are stopping to buy food of these big processes they are going to the farmers they're establishing direct connections solid direct uh, uh, agriculture food cobs who buy directly people start to change towards regional food towards seasonal food uh, and, and and towards organic food and and I think oh, this is my big hope, uh, voters on one side, but on the other side, the consumer's behavior that more and more realize that food is more than just a commodity, but it's basically what makes us alive and what keeps us alive and what defines our lives. And uh, more and more citizens are reflecting on that and stopping to eat highly processed food and going back to, let's say, what they find in their regions and to reconnect with the farmers, which is also a concept that uh, allows farmers to stay alive with their incomes and to feed their families and to actually grant them uh, positive feedback on good strategies of farming, which we also have and we also see around us.
Tomás, te agradecemos muchísimo todo, todo lo que has dicho. For everything that you have said, and it actually encourages us to continue. And if you have time to answer during the second round before you have to know, before you have to go, could you tell us about these proposals from the social, uh, civil society that is organized around the citizenship movements globally, so that we can attack and counteract uh, against these lobbies. But I would like, if you can, before you have to leave, from the, the Greens uh, perspective, how is it you're facing the situation in the parliament? What are your proposals to try and counteract all of this lobbying movement that prevents us from making any progress so that we can change things as you just indicated? Please go ahead. I will not have too much time, but uh, that's a very, very complex question. And I think if I would only answer in the in the work that uh, where Olga Kiku and her organization and the other animal welfare organizations are closely cooperating with us and we with them, only in this sector, it would take me an hour to explain how we fight back and how, we, how lobbies are actually trying to stop us. Uh, but basically it's citizens' interest, it's commons it's our common water it's our common nature and landscape uh, it's it's our the interest of the peoples against the vested interest of corporations for maximizing their revenues this is the battle that we have we're having ongoing uh, we will face an attempt of the commission to change the regulation on, on gmos as an example to allow new gmos to be totally deregulated and spill our markets uh, we're, we're having massive pushbacks from meat industry uh, when it comes to limit transportation times of animals, where we know we reach a lot of citizens' hearts and we have a lot of support in public. That public support is our best, best and biggest weapon uh, to actually uh, convince or even pressure other members of the European Parliament or even governments to, to come along and to change stuff there. Uh, it's, it's, so it's not the majority in the Parliament itself, but it's public attention. And also to refer back to Olga once again, because our cooperation is very important and her voice in the Parliament is very important. This End the Cage Age European Citizen Initiative. I know the citizens' initiatives are not perfect, but they are a tool to express, for citizens to express express their concerns directly to the Commission, and they force the Commission to deal with that issue. And this NDKH uh, Civil uh, uh, European Citizen Initiative was one of the most successful one, and this has an impact. The same counts for the Save Bees and Farmers, which has just reached 1.2 million signatures just a few days before the end of, 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 of their time. Uh, they had and these, these initiatives are even though you don't see the effect automatically, but it's putting pressure on my political colleagues, it's putting pressure on the commission. And I must say, watch out your national representation. Spanish MEPs are within the worst when it comes to agriculture. I must really say that. They are defending industrial agriculture Absolutely. And there's no difference between social democrats and conservatives. I just let you know that. Yeah, It's horrifying what they are doing in the European Parliament. Uh, they're, they're, I don't know if they are bought or they really believe what they do, but it's really difficult, especially with your Spanish MEPs. So watch out uh, in the next elections. Really look what they are doing, not what they're saying Sunday times. This is my last recommendation. Quote, politicians along what they are gracias. Her, what they are doing and not about what they are promoting i have to leave thank you very much for inviting me and all the best stay on track and best wishes from brussels gracias tomás por tu tiempo thank you so much thomas for your time and we will keep that answer in mind given by thomas to start the second round, we're going to start with Nazareth. We started with her. She was the first one to speak. And we're going to ask Nazareth to talk about these proposals. The proposals that you were mentioning previously, those that resistance that we had at the beginning. And as Thomas said at the beginning, well, we see that popular power um, is what we need to have. We need to face these harsh realities. And I know that sometimes you are even risking your lives when, when you do your investigations and, and 
but in the end, these initiatives have given some fruit, haven't they? You had some examples. Could you please share them with us, Nazareth? Thank you so much, Lydia. Well, I wanted to start by linking it with a question that has been asked in the chat because there was someone who was asking about whether this is this is linked to if glyphosate is linked to child leukemia and yes that's one of the diseases there are others such as fetal malformations and abortions neurological diseases dermatological diseases but also some sorts of cancer and leukemia amongst children who are under 15 and this is the best way to to transition to the resistance processes because the first scientist in Argentina who actually identified and who, who, who tested and showed that there is a link between glyphosate and uh, child leukemia was Andres Carrasco. And this was at the beginning of the century. And the answer that the state gave was denying it, completely denying it. And they actually started um, a campaign against him and trying to to attack his career. This was a person who was um, who was quite prestigious in the scientific uh, sector, and they destroyed his career. The state destroyed his career, and this shows the power of lobbies, an amazing power that lobbies had, as Thomas said, especially in a country such as Argentina, where the uh, dollar dependencies and currency dependency that has to do with soy export exports is so great that up till now no government has been able to free himself from this model. So what happened? Well, Andres Carrasco is still a reference for this whole movement called the uh, Fair Science or Dignified Science. He died a few years ago. It's worthy science and he has created a following and he was linked to the mothers of Ituitzango that I referred to previously and now there are more scientists working with them. So at the beginning it was citizen resistance and they were capable, I mean, these citizens were capable of resisting the situation. They were the ones who were suffering the impact. They were the ones who were capable of uh, getting the attention of some researchers and to the extent that they gave visibility to all of these problems and the media were actually hiding those problems. Not long ago, we got the Monsanto papers that showed that there had been a whole disinformation campaign, an amazing campaign to try and cover this impact up. But the citizen resistance managed to show what was going on. So these are resistant. Uh, there is a I don't know if you know um, John Nossiter, who uses this metaphor. He says that there is uh, to face the monster. You can face the monster or give your back to the monster. So these mothers and the network of, of, of people who have been impacted or um, lawyers and scientists and, and researchers, they are, they, are actually, they are actually facing the monster. And as I said, these these people were facing the monster but there are other resistance well they actually face the monster and the power of these lobbies but there are other resist and the other resistance that are actually giving their back to the monster what they do is they work as little ants and they create other ways of acting other ways of farming for instance and here i'm going to continue with the case of argentina so that it is more consistent and because i think it is very interesting but this is happening the world over it's happening in spain and in other european countries countries as well. There is an explosion of um, movements, initiatives, experiences around the idea of food sovereignty, agroecological experiences and all sorts of initiatives like such as marketing and from theory and activism, they are bringing about this, this new stage and they're they're showing that we have to consume in a different way and that are making this bond between production agroecological production with a new way of consuming, consuming critically, understanding that consumption is also a political act. And in the case of Argentina, it's noteworthy to talk about UTT, the Union of Land Workers. They 
produce in an agroecological way and they distribute as well. They have realized that the bottleneck is usually distribution because the power of supermarkets um, is great because they set the prices and the conditions and they have decided to distribute on their own and now they have their own storage facilities, they have their own stores and this explo exploited really with, uh, with the confinement, this sort of consumption took flight and, and this is when it started to grow and what's interesting about the UTT is that they have a vision that is a global vision of the problem with the land and with agriculture. And, and feminism is always present in their debates within UTT. The rural workers at the UTT always say, and I, I agree completely, that agribusiness is part of the patriarchy. And if that is the way, then feminism needs to defend agroecology. And they put in the forefront this idea of the similarity between uh, violence against women's bodies and the violence applied against the earth through these mechanisms, these brutal mechanisms. And since I don't have much time left, I wanted to briefly make the link with what Thomas was saying. And you have to remember that multinationals, multinationals that are benefiting from this model, that are um, that are proposing this model and that are trying to end with other initiatives have been subsidized. Sometimes it's direct financing that happens with meat industry in Spain, with tax evasion, with uh, multinationals, and in many different ways. And I always insist on this because it seems, I mean, they sell that, that small production, agri, agri, um, eco-agriculture needs subsidies because they're not profitable. But if you start looking into it, if you start looking into the situation, you see that they are more profitable and they're more efficient if multinationals didn't have those subsidies or if they were to pay their taxes or if they were to pay the hidden costs. If they were not subsidized by our taxes, they wouldn't be that profitable. So to summarize, social resistance in all of its ways, I mean, facing the monster with your consumption, with your votes, but also demonstrating and going to the streets to ask for a better common agricultural policy so that we don't have a new treaty within the EU to just take the streets and pressure so that we can counteract the lobbies. Thank you so much, Nazaret. And linking what you said with what Thomas said as well and giving the floor to Natasha and Olga, there is a question for both of them. And uh, you can decide who will take the floor, Natasha or Olga. We don't really have much time left. So let's try and, and summarize and regroup those questions that uh, deal with the same topic. So Natasha and Olga, you are being asked about whether you think there is aquaculture and sustainable fishing or according to your experience, um, I'm guessing that Paula is referring because she's the one asking, if you think that there is real sustainability after everything that we have said. And Elena, uh, Elena also asks a question that can maybe be linked to what Nazaret was saying and responding to what Thomas was saying and that I would like to ask you just to finish. I mean, Natasha and Olga, um, it's about the power of the citizenship. How can we face all of this what do you think about how the population acts now in the 21st century how the access to information social networks etc that we have helps i mean do we have too much information do we have too little information should we have more initiatives such as sustainable um, marketing and so on what do you think about this and also take into account what thomas says that depending on the context we're in we need more or less pressure in the spanish case we obviously need to exercise more pressure we need to exercise more pressure um it's what nazaret said we have to organize ourselves please natasha go ahead if you if you wish to start Thank you, Lydia, um, and thanks for the questions um, which I've been following on the chat. They're very interesting to hear um, the, the opinions that are being expressed in the questions. So on the question of whether there's such a thing as sustainable aquaculture, um, clearly in the current situation, what we're seeing is the development of 
very unsus unsustainable aquaculture. And the big problem, as I um, showed in my presentation, is that we're pursuing the growth of um, a part of the industry that has put huge pressure on fish in the wild. Has There are huge issues around the very intensive form of fish farming that we see in the salmon farming industry, for example, with very high stocking densities, um, in, you know, external impacts such as pollution from those farms impacting on local um, ecosystems. So the, the, the model of aquaculture that we're pursuing is not a sustainable model. That is not to say that there um, are not more sustainable and less impactful forms of aquaculture. Um, I alluded to um, mussel production. Um, we know that um, the, the production of, of mollusks is much less um, impactful if you look at the, the type of inputs that are used. It's very low input aquaculture. You still need to look at how you do that farming. So you, there, are, there are, I'm sure, um, multiple things to take into account with any form of aquaculture. But there is potential there. But what we're seeing is that companies are pursuing the very high value added Part of the market, which is salmon farming and um, prawn farming. These are um, parts of the industry that, for example, big financial investors find very attractive. So this is where the, the big money is currently being channeled. And that's a big problem because it, it shapes the industry. So what we need, and I think um, Olga referred in her presentation to the Commission's strategic guidelines on aquaculture, um, we need a more strategic look at what's being um, pushed um, in terms of subsidies as well, the kinds of subsidies that are being given at EU level and beyond, um, and then how we shape the market going forward. So the, the answer is potentially, but certainly not in the way things are currently done. And then on Elena's question about the role of um, citizens, now I'm going to take a very sort of changing markets um, perspective on this, and it happens to be my view as well. There's a a, a huge focus on what individual consumers can do um, and across all the campaigns we work on that's a question that we get very often what can the consumer do and of course we always provide um, pointers and advice on what consumers can do but the reality is that the responsibility for solving a lot of these problems if not all of them very firmly lies with the companies that are creating them in the first place and for um, those companies to step up and behave more responsibly, we need very, very strong regulation and we need um, a very clear message that certain practices will not be tolerated. Um, now, I'm, I think the, the situation we find ourselves in currently is one where companies in the corporate sector are all powerful and, and we've heard about the very powerful lobbies at the EU level, for example, in, in Spain. Now, that's a very, very difficult nut to crack. But I think for us as changing markets, we want to hear more about the, the role and responsibility of companies. And we need to be naming and shaming very strongly companies that are beha behaving irresponsibly. We need to really understand the supply chains in, in a much more detailed way and understand where responsibility lies and not hesitate to identify companies that behave irresponsibly. So that's a very quick response from me, but happy to um, provide details if anybody wants to pursue that conversation. Gracias, Natasha. Olga, cuando quieras un minutito, por favor. Just a minute, if, if you could. Okay, I need to be very quick because I understand there's not much time. Um, first of all, regarding the, the fish and the sustainability of fish farming, um, there's certainly some uh, uh, fish farming, especially that of carnivorous fish, like salmon, like other types of fish, um, the, this is not sustainable. Certainly, uh, this is something we need to move away from. Um, but also uh, what we would like as an animal welfare organization um, also working on food and farming issues. Um, what we bring into the discussion is also the much needed discussion and debate about the sentience of fish. Um, we look at other animals um, and we, we see them much differently than we see fish. Um, so we need to start thinking about fish as individuals, um, as uh, social animals and uh, animals who can, who are intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm not gonna go too deeply into this now because of the lack of time, 
But um, uh, unfortunately, as, um, as citizens, um, we see that um, uh, there is uh, less awareness about uh, fish sentience than there is uh, for other animals. So we need to uh, increase, let's say, our attention to, to, this, um, to this issue. Um, so if we do that, then, uh, you know, farming fish uh, will, will take a whole new perspective. Um, regarding the role of citizens, um, there, there are many things we can do. Um, first of all, just the existence of so many civil society organizations and the role of civil society in today's uh, world is, is so important. We should not underestimate the power of the people. Um, we, we have... Um, tools with us, and one of them is the, the European Citizens Initiative, which is a more sort of formal tool, but there are many other tools that we can use, and both campaigning and lobbying are very, very important. So raising awareness, educating people, and raising awareness in the, among the public is, is extremely important, but, but we don't want to stay there. We want to move on, and we want to move to reforms. And this is how we, we do, we try to do our lobbying, basically to put pressure on policymakers, um, not only at EU level, but also at state level, national level. And um, a lot of times we don't do that much. As, as civil society organizations, we look a lot at doing investigations, raising awareness among the public, among citizens, um, educating people, but we need to do more lobbying and we need to actually hold uh, politicians accountable. Uh, we vote for them, but we can also vote them out. Um, and, uh, and politicians, you know, they care about this and they, they, they need to listen more to their constituents, not just the industry, not just those who have economic interests um, in this case. And I have to, I, I will, I know that there is no time, but I, I want to close with what Thomas said about Spanish MEPs. I have found exactly that I have exactly the same experience as Thomas has, um, regardless of the party. Okay, we're not talking about uh, Greens or others, but mainly the big two parties. Um, it, we have found that um, Spanish MEPs more or less represent the industry. They're there to speak for the industry, and we see how they vote. Um, and um, and it's it's really unfortunate. So I, I, we call on the, on the Spanish people um, to take note of that and to put pressure on Spanish politicians, those elected in Spain, but those also elected and sent to the European Parliament um, to actually um, listen to their own citizens, not just the industry and the, you know, especially here, the agribusiness industry. Gracias, Olga. Nos quedamos con ese... Thank you so much, Olga. We will keep that message in mind. We repeat it and repeat it over and over again, and we should keep on repeating it. I would like to thank all the speakers. We are sorry we don't have any more time. Um, I think that all we have said was very interesting. There are lots of questions in the chat, but we will have to leave it at that. I wanted to thank Natasha and Olga and Nazaret and Thomas, who had to leave early. Um, for their interventions and I'm sure that those questions could be answered during the next session which I hope we will have and please come uh, next October 14th we will have another session we will have Adana Vasiva during that that presentation she will talk about food sovereignty uh, versus corporate control so we will talk about all of these things thank you all so much I would like to thank the Green Europeans Foundation, the Fundación Transición Verde, and all of you who have participated in this session. Thank you so much. See you soon.